السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى characterized us in this room and all of the believers before and after us with one of the highest praises given in the Quran كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس you are the best of all nations that I have caused to be brought out for mankind. Now, before I even finish the verse, because you all know what the verse says, notice there is a notion of service and khidmah to mankind in the verse itself. Before we even get to the description, Allah is setting up our paradigm. What is our paradigm? Ukhrijat linnas. You were brought for another purpose. You weren't brought for yourselves. You weren't brought to live your lives. Carpe diem, seize the moment. You were brought for another purpose. And what is that purpose? Ukhrijat linnas. You were brought forth for the rest of mankind. You serve a goal. You serve a function. And that function is you're supposed to do something for other people. Which other people? Every other people. Not ukhrijat lil American, ukhrijat lil Saudiin, ukhrijat lil Khalij, ukhrijat linnas. Every one of us. We have a responsibility to everybody else. Now that is a massive responsibility. That is a huge burden, but Allah has praised us for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the status of being the very best of all ummas. And how do we attain that status? Three things are mentioned. Three things are mentioned. We need to understand what all of these three are and live up to them. You command what is good, you forbid what is right, and you demonstrate belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, not only are you talking the talk, you're walking the walk. Not only are you speaking what you're supposed to say, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ billah. So you command what is good, you forbid what is evil, and you demonstrate belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this obligation, it is so profound and so beautiful and also so comforting. Why? Because multiple things can be said as usual, time is always against us. Of the biggest blessings that Allah has given in this ayah, is that he's made us responsible for only the output and not the reaction. We only must give and then what happens to our giving, we are not responsible for. I.e., our goal is to convey, not to convert. Our goal is to convey, not to force conversion. Because if your goal becomes conversion, if your goal becomes, I want this guy to embrace my faith, that raises a whole bunch of problems. First and foremost, you're taking responsibility for what you have no control over. You can't help how somebody's going to react. You don't know what their response will be to the message. Secondly, when your goal becomes conversion, this might influence your pitching of the product. If you're a dirty salesman, right? and you have to sell something. If your goal is to sell, you might start saying things about the product that you shouldn't say. That's how salespeople work. You might start exaggerating, you might start covering up, you might start. But if your goal is a description of the product and not necessarily to sell it, now all of a sudden, you have to be 100% honest. And that changes the discourse. All too often, when people make it their goal to convert, they start saying things they shouldn't say. And our job is not to change the truth, our job is to convey the truth. Allah says, your job is to convey, my job is to judge. Allah says, 
لست عليهم بمسيطر. You are not in charge of forcing them. You are not their boss. Literally, literally, you are not their boss. Allah says, "أف أنت تكره الناس حتى تكونوا مؤمنين." Will you force people until they embrace Islam? That's not your job. Your job is not the forcing. Your job is the conveying. And how do we convey? We convey by teaching with wisdom. We convey by preaching morality. We convey by demonstrating iman. That's what we do. So, da'wah is done according to the Quran, not just with the tongue, but with your entire actions and your body. Da'wah is done not just by memorizing arguments, but by demonstrating belief in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And dare I say, and I know this is gonna perhaps be misunderstood, but I will try to say this in a gentle manner. Most da'wah is not done by intellectual arguments. Most conversion does not take place because somebody has come along and presented a very watertight proof for some abstract issue of Islam. The majority of da'wah is done from the heart to the heart. The majority of conversion takes place because of good manners and akhlaq, because of interaction with the other in which something is sparked in the other person and they want to find out why are you so different? What makes you so special? It wasn't a deep, philosophical, profound truth that sparked a light bulb moment in the life of the other. It was something super simple, like maybe even praising Allah at times of tragedy, like maybe demonstrating dignity, dignity when the Gaza massacre is taking place, like maybe even the Ammu Khalid showing the sabr that he shows when his granddaughter passes away. That's how da'wah is done. And I say this because all too often when you're young, you think da'wah is by advanced debates. Da'wah is by memorizing the arguments and deconstructing the trinity of Christianity and understanding the proofs for the existence of God and whatnot. No, 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 no. That's 1% of da'wah. I'm not saying it's not there. That's like 1%. 99% of preaching is done via simply interacting in a positive manner. And in fact, this is exactly what the seerah and the early biographies of the Sahaba demonstrate for us. Most of the people converted simply by seeing the akhlaq of the Muslims, by recognizing what these people are doing and not by the deep argument. The arguments will come, but those arguments, in order for them to be effective, it must have a precursor. And the precursor is you make the person receptive to those arguments. You make them genuinely curious. You make them open up to the reality that there are other civilizations, other faiths. And you do that not by appealing to the mind, but by appealing to the heart and the soul. You do that by conquering their hearts before you conquer their intellectual arguments. You want evidence for this? The entirety of the seerah. One simple example should suffice for to prove this before I move on to my next point. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was he doing for 40 years before the coming of the revelation? You do realize the Prophet lived for 63 years, 40 of which he was not preaching a new theology. The bulk of his life, he was not engaging in intellectual arguments against the other. The bulk of his life, 40 years, he was not preaching anything new. The Quran came down when he was 40 years old. So for 23 years, he's preaching. For 40 years, what is the purpose of that? All too often, we zoom over as if that's the precursor. No, those 40 years were needed in order to make the next 23 effective. Those 40 years laid the precursors. They were the foundations for the next 23 years. Now, what were those 40 years? What did he do in those 40 years? Well, very simple. He established social credibility and he gained the hearts and minds and love and admiration for his entire people. They all loved him. That was needed in order for the next 23 years to be effective. He was known as a Sadiq decades before anybody called him Ya Rasulullah. He was called an Amin 
before Jibreel came down with the wahi and made him a Nabi. The akhlaq is needed before the intellectual arguments. The compassion, the humanity, the interaction, the admiration. And that will be won. And that will be gained at the human individual level without the need for detailed advanced discussions of Islamic philosophy and the proofs for the existence of God and what is this deconstruction and how to talk about liberalism and this. And no, that is simply done by smiling in the face of those whom you meet and being generous to them. Simple as that. You show them the meaning of akhlaq. You show them the strength of iman. And we see this in the people of Gaza over and over again. I mentioned here on stage and, and yesterday as well, that in the last nine months, thousands of people have embraced Islam. Tens of thousands are interested in admiring the people of Gaza. Why? Because they studied the Quran? No, because the people of Gaza have demonstrated what it means when you believe in God and facing trial and adversity. That has stirred the hearts and minds of people in ways that reading and intellectual debates will never do. So you really want to give da'wah? You don't need to go through da'wah training school. You just need to start acting in the prophetic manner. You need to start absorbing the akhlaq, the humility. Allah says in the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were harsh, and strict in nature, your own companions would have left you. You have to show genuine compassion and love to the people around you. You have to show genuine humility and exemplary akhlaq. And then they will open up to the intellectual arguments. And that will be done by proudly practicing your faith in spite of all the negativity surrounding it. By demonstrating each and every aspect of piety, of taqwa, of honesty. And I have so many stories in my own life and my friends and family and my acquaintances and hearing all of the people. Do you know, subhanAllah, one of my, one of my uh, teachers, he told me a story about how his, his wife is a, is, a, is a convert. She's a Western lady and then she converted to Islam. The story of her conversion is demonstrative of this akhlaq. When she was younger, she considered herself a very beautiful lady and she would dress up very, you know, attractive manner. And every single person, she would work in an office, every person would come and every young man would try to flirt and look and stare and whatnot. And she enjoyed that attention. Until finally, she met her match. And that match was a young, dignified, foreign student from a Muslim land who was embodying the akhlaq of Islam. Every time this young man would come, he would not stare at her body. He would look down and he would address her in the most honorable of terms. And he would not ever flirt. She says, at first I was irritated. Am I not beautiful? Can't you see what I'm dressed as? Can't you look at me? But eventually something about him as he continued, he has to take care of his bills, whatever he's coming all the time. Eventually something about him demonstrated this is a true gentleman. This is how a man is supposed to interact. Nobody's ever done this before. And so she said to him, where are you from? He said some line, why are you not looking at me? Literally, why are you not staring at me? And he said, because I'm a Muslim. And my Quran tells me to lower my gaze and to not stare at lust. You are too precious to be stared at in this manner. And that was the first time she'd ever heard of Islam. This is back in the 70s. It was a you know, story back in the day. The first time she ever heard of Islam. And she started researching on her own back in the 70s until that led her to embrace the faith. And then she eventually married one of the scholars of Islam. Subhanallah. This is what you mean, akhlaq. This is how da'wah is given. Not by some advanced deconstruction of falsafah and, and proving the existence of God and whatnot. At the human level, just showing what it means to be a believer. You know, another convergent story amongst my friends, right? Again, this is so small things here, right? Is that one of my, I used to work in, you know this, I used to be chemical engineering once upon a time. I have worked at Dow Chemical for a while. I have my, I used to work in corporate for a little while, right? And so, this story is an interesting story as well. You know, when you're in, when you're in corporate, 
You know that you get a, 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 a per diem, you get an amount every single day when you travel, where you can you know, spend and splurge and go and, 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 and eat and drink and, and tab the company, right? And the per diem amount back then, I know it's much more now, but back then I think it was like $35. This is a long time ago. I don't know how much it is now, but back then it was $35. And every single person, whoever would go outside, would spend the max 35. And no bills required is 35 and just like khalas, you know, just, you know, charge the company. Except one Muslim in my company. One Muslim brother, he would go because back then you, there was no halal food. So he would get like your McFish sandwich at McDonald's, right? And, you know, a water and then contract out and say, $3.45, back then it was $3.45, whatever it was, right? And he would say $3.45 every single day. Can you believe the company accountant tracked down this Muslim brother? The company accountant tracked down this Muslim brother in the company and called him a visit, I forgot which one, and asked him, you know, out of all of the hundreds of employees, every single one of them maxes out and we don't require receipts. You're the only one out of all of the company that charges us one tenth that we're willing to give you and you send your McDonald's receipt as well. You're the only one. Why? She's perplexed. And once again, he says, well, because my religion tells me I have to be honest. And even if you give me $35, I didn't spend $35. And this is all I spent. And I just want to be showing you, this is all I spent. And this impressed her so much. She began doing her research about Islam. And one thing led to another, subhanAllah. This is what I mean. These small matters of akhlaq. You demonstrating what faith actually means. You bring it to the table and you show people what your faith does for you. Over and over again, O oh Muslims, da'wah is not complicated. You don't need to have a PhD in Islamic sciences and falsafah. Da'wah is done one-on-one -on -one at the individual level. You demonstrate, you showcase, this country needs to see the morality of Islam, the akhlaq of Islam, the dignity of Islam. And we must speak the truth, no matter how politically incorrect it is. I don't want to go too deep in this topic, but one of the realities we're facing now is morality and sexuality. The whole world is going crazy. We cannot compromise on our principles. And we must demonstrate what it means to be a family-based system. We must demonstrate izzah to the family. We must showcase what it means for the husband and wife to come together as husbands and wives of two opposite genders and to have a family together. And the mother is a mother and the father is a father and the two are not the same. And we need to demonstrate this because you know what? It's just a fad what they say. You can't change biology. And if we persist in the truth, and we already saw this when the school systems wanted to change and start preaching alternative understandings, even mainstream Christians didn't know what to do. It was the Muslims who stood up and said, no way, you're not going to cross that line. You're not going to teach our children that which is immoral and unethical and against human nature. And they protested. Dearborn, Michigan, here in Maryland, in D.C., other places. And I gave a lecture at that time that, subhanAllah, it went viral in the Christian community. Multiple Christian pastors took my lecture and they propagated it on the same channels that a decade before had been anti-Islamic. And they said, you know what? We must have misunderstood these Muslims because they're saying what no Christian dares say. They're speaking the truth. I got contacted by ministers and priests around the world asking me for talk shows, what not, because they were finally hearing some common sense. I have a whole khutbah about this reality, right? And this is how you're going to save the rest of the world by preaching the truth. And again, we can't force anybody. That's the Quran. You can't force. But you must preach the truth. You must dignify. You must exude the morality of Islam. So to conclude, brothers and sisters, really very simple. My genuine, sincere, honest advice. Don't complicate what Allah has made very simple. 
You are taught that da'wah is obligatory. And that scares people. Oh my God, I'm not qualified to give da'wah. I say to you, da'wah is obligatory and you are qualified to give da'wah. Because what you understand of da'wah is not the da'wah you need to give. The da'wah you need to give is literally be prophetic in your akhlaq. The da'wah you need to give, live the life of Islam. Be honest in your workplace. Be generous, be humble in your corporations, in your offices, when everybody's involved in dirty politics and backbiting and backstabbing. You never get involved in that. You never get involved in the dirty politics. You demonstrate your tongue is more pure than that. You are kind to everybody. You are smiling with everybody. You are honest with everybody. That is the best da'wah you can give. When it's time to pray, I have a story from my own childhood, from my own teenage years before I went to study Islam. And I guess I'll conclude with that story as well, right? Is that uh, once upon a time, how, when was this? 1993, 94, when I, was, when I was a teenager. And the world was a very different place, right? And I was driving between two cities in Texas and you know, I had a, a foreign sheikh with me from uh, another land and I was driving him. I was his driver to between two conferences. This is back in the 90s, early 90s. I was a teenager. And the sheikh said, it's time to pray. Uh, uh, we need to pray now. I said, sheikh, um, we're in Texas. These are small towns. I don't think you understand. I mean, I'm from Texas. You have to understand these small towns are different. Sheikh, it's probably not the wisest thing to just stop on the side of the road and pray. He goes, no, no, I want to pray now. And you just, Bismillah, let's just pray here. So I was like making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What am I going to do? And we found... Uh, uh, the only place that was there before you know uh, Asr finished, he wanted to pray Dhuhr on time. He, even though he, he knew his Musaf, he wanted to make Jama'ah between Dhuhr and Asr time. We found a truck stop, and you know truckers, yani, they are different. You know, I mean, it is what it is, right? We that way. And I'm like, what do we do now? I drove to the other side of the truck station, and. I tried to put my car between them and the trucks, right? And I had the prayer rug, we put it out. And the sheikh is dressed in his thobe and everything. And he's like, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> like that. And I'm like, oh my God, what do we do now? I'm like really scared right now. And I see the truckers start poking hands and whatnot. And they start gathering on the other side. And we're praying and doing sajda. And I see them talking amongst themselves, pointing at us, right? And I'm like, I'm just a kid, ya sheikh, I'm 17 years old. What do I do now? Ya Allah, protect us. And I'm in charge of taking a sheikh between conferences. And he doesn't understand this is America and I'm in Texas. What not? I'm literally like making dua in sajda, right? Because these are truckers, like five of them are talking, they're pointing and whatnot. And you know, tattoos, everything. And we're praying. And our sheikh, mashallah, is in a different world, right? Full, khushur, tamkeen, everything. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Doing the adhkar. They notice we're done. One of them starts walking our way, and I'm like, khalas, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks up and he says, Are you guys done? I said, uh, Yes, we are. Uh, can we help you? He goes, I want to ask, why did you stop here? And we said, I said, because the Shaykh was being, I said, well, it was time for our regular prayers. We're Muslims and we have to pray on the side of the word, we're road. And he goes, that's what we were discussing, who you people were, what you're doing. And we figured out, because this is the 90s, we figured out that you're Muslims and you're praying. And I just want to say that if everybody paused in their day to worship God, the way you guys do, the world would be a better place. Thank you and God bless you. And when he said that, my heart felt so guilty because of where I was going and where he was going. And ever since that day, I have never been embarrassed to pray anywhere in public. Never. Why should I be embarrassed? If somebody says something, whatever. But I have to pray and that's what I need to do. So simple reality, O Muslims. You do you. You be proud of Islam. Be proud of who you are. Practice your faith. And that is the best da'wah. And that's the only da'wah you need to give. Just do Islam. Practice Islam. Live Islam. And leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.